week. So I want to do just a real quick recap, as I pretty much always kind of do. It's good for us to go over some of these uh, fundamental things anyway, just on a regular basis, because they need to be in the forefront of our thinking, and they need to be part of our thinking and uh, understanding. So kind of where we are right now, we've talked about this probably ad nauseum, but again, to repeat the same things over and over again, to reinforce it, always a good thing. We talked about how, for example, there exists two books in the New Testament that seem to very centrally um, take on the subject of the book of Enoch. Um, and it's important to recognize them in this light because this isn't how these books are really presented to us by Christendom, by the theologians, or by our ministers. And so we have to look with our spiritual eyes to understand what's going on. Um, basically, all of what I'm trying to put across is objective, objectively there and literarily exists within the text. And so we have to take it seriously as to what it's telling us. Again, Beginning with the quote of Jude, which we pretty much go over every time. Um, again, when he cites the name of the book in 14 and 15, it says in Enoch, the seventh from Adam, right? Again, he cites the name of the source, right? Okay, so that's just an objective feature that exists literarily within the scriptures. You can't really deny that he's citing the book, right? So he gives it to his antiquity, of course. As we mentioned, he's the seventh from Adam, right? right? So he's old, right? He's ancient. So he's giving him his antiquity here, right? He says that he prophesied, right? Right? So that means, of course, that he is a prophet, right? According to Jude's point of view. So again, how lightly should we take this or how seriously we should take this I think just depends on how, whether we believe what God is saying here. Because again, the prophets were, you know, led by the Holy Spirit and inspired. So, and then he says that he spoke, prophesied of these men. Right? So what he's saying is it's relevant to his age, right? Right? Because it is still applies to the people who were what? These certain men crept in unawares who were before of old, right, right, spoken of, right? And so it's relevant. And then the big quote, of course, is, Behold the Lord cometh. You know, he cometh, right? And all the rest of that, right? So it has to do with the end of the age. Okay, so... Just in a, you could make just basically a sweeping statement that the book of Enoch is ancient, that it is prophetic, that it is relevant to Jude's age, right, and that it is relevant to the uh, end of the age. So those of us who believe that we are at the end of the age, there should be some means, there should be some mechanism, maybe baked into the canon, that would allow us to accept this book at the end of the age, because that's kind of the point. This is kind of the, the, the thing that he's pointing out here. So what can we read into this, first of all? Did people have questions? Like, for example, before he, he, before he even gives the quote, right, why does he preface it this way? Why does he put that preface there, right? I think people might have had questions, right? Is that, is this a valid source, right? Were people asking, is this valid, right? So he validates it by citing it, right? People might have had questions, is it old, right? So he validates it by saying it is old, by calling him the seventh from Adam. Why does he do that? Because the answer betrays the question. The answer, right, is that the, the, these questions that people were yeah. having, is Enoch genuinely a prophet, yeah. right? That must have been a question that was floating because he answers that, he prophesied, right? So you can derive the questions from the answers, right? And again, is it relevant to our age? Is it, what does, did, if it was valid, if it was, did it end with the flood? Does it bear on our age? Well, 
Obviously, because he says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of the saints to execute judgment. You see what I'm saying? So it, it's way beyond the, the age of the, the flood. So, you know, it applies to the age following the flood. Right. So he makes a number of assertions, right? Um, Jude, still talking about Jude. He talks about how this was spoken by the apostles. Right? That the apostles taught this, right? And just like Dr. Mystic was saying before, when he talks about when, when Yeshua you? calls himself the son of man, right. that's something that's heavily spoken of in the book of Enoch, right? When he talks about, um, you know, the, 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 the elect one, for example, in Luke, he is spoken of in exactly those terms. He, this is my son, the elect one, hear ye him. So with the book floating around, as we know, uh, in, you know, by the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know that that book was floating around at the time, that there were congregations who were reading and believing that book. Was this something that Yeshua taught, right? Because, he's, because Jude makes the assertion that the apostles taught this, right? So now, with the, the, those things kind of, this is our understanding from the book of Jude. That it was something that was taught by the apostles that, again, he cites the source by names. He doesn't just allude to it sort of indirectly. He says it. So he owns it, right? He says it's old. He says it's prophecy. He says it's relevant. He says it will be relevant at the time of the Lord's coming. That's his assertion. Whether you're an atheist, whether you're a Christian, it doesn't matter. That's literally what is in the text. That is literally what he is saying. So it's not something that you can kind of... You know, when people do, they kind of get wishy-washy about it, and they kind of get mealy-mouthed about it, and they kind of like, well, just because he says this doesn't mean this, does You know what I'm saying? But you, but you just are straightforward about it. If you just make his way straight, you, that's what he's saying. And so, apparently, people had questions about this. Is this something that the apostles taught? Well, what better thing to do than to take it to an apostle, right? So what do they do, right? Apparently, they take this book to Peter. Right? And do, can we derive any answers from, or any questions from the answers that Peter gives? Nothing. Right? Because if they, if they take this book of Jude and they ask him, hey, is this something that you apostles taught, really? Right? Is this really ancient? Is it really prophetic? Okay? We got it from Jude. We want to hear it from you. Right? A person could surmise those kinds of things because why does Peter take this book and write around it? Why does he write commentary on it? Why does he address it at all? And what does he have to say about it? Right? So Peter apparently writes a letter in response to these questions. Is this apostolic? Peter affirms that. He says, you know, this is something that we the apostles, you know, brought to you. For example, when he says that we did not follow cunningly concocted fables when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, right. right? What is the quote? Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. Okay? So what is that? That is the power and that is the coming, right? right. See? The power to execute judgment when he comes, right? So when Peter says that we did not follow cleverly concocted fables, okay, so we did not follow cleverly concocted fables when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord, right? What is he addressing? People think that the book of Enoch is a fable. They think it's made up. They don't think that it's apostolic. They don't think it comes from the apostles, right? They have questions as to its authenticity. They have questions as to its antiquity. They have questions as to its relevance. They have questions as to whether or not it's going to be valid at the end of the age. So taking this all into mind, what other kind of question does he answer, right? He also says that, um, he, he talks about in 2 Peter, the world of old. The world of old was destroyed, right? The old world, right? So his references to the old world are with reference to the antediluvian world. So the old world, the, the question of its antiquity, right, 
he answers by saying that prophets of old, right, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So if of old is his term for the antediluvian world, he's saying that the antediluvian prophets um, which are of course of old right, because it was the world of old, the antediluvian world that was destroyed, right? So he says that the antediluvian prophets spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay, so why does he answer that question? Because Enoch is a prophet of old, right, and he was and he inspired by the Holy Spirit. That seems to be what Peter is saying. So here we have a mechanism that's baked into, let me put this here, Jude, into two books. One essentially written around the other that exists within our canon that form an argument that basically when you read to it, when you read through it, that antediluvian prophets such as Enoch were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's not for your private interpretation, right? that it was not a cleverly concocted fable. The book of Enoch is not a fable. When we, the apostles, right, in other words, told you about the power and his coming, right, that we were not following cleverly concocted fables. So Enoch is not that. So now we have this validation that Christians should universally accept because you have to sort of like, at what point are you going to negate this? Like, are you going to come along and say, uh, that he's not quoting that book, oh, it's not old. I mean, you, you have to put yourself against the Holy Spirit to come out against this book. But apparently that's what people did. Because they saw through the eyes of men. They, th they saw through the eyes of logic. And, and this is why when, when you read um, in the, the epistles of Yeshua to the various churches in Revelation, you see him, um, you know, sort of hinting at that we had lost our first love that we had lost something from the beginning and that some people they just didn't they didn't focus on that original teaching because apparently this was the original teaching of the apostles and apparently all that stuff about the son of man that's written in the book of Enoch it would follow that if Yeshua was saying that he was the fulfillment of those prophecies that they would preach that book because again Yeshua was the fulfillment of that stuff that's all the son of man prophecies and all that other stuff that you read in the book of Enoch that is relevant. That seems to be the case. So when you read in the in the book of Enoch, and I hope everybody has one of these things, it's just page one if you open it up. Just read what it says first thing. It says, the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the, ele uh, the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, right, when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. Right? In other words, at the coming of the Lord, right? So this book is to be restored to us essentially as a blessing, right? So with the backing of the New Testament, we can look at this and say, okay, this book is to be restored to us. This is when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But again, not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. So in other words, what he's essentially saying that it's not for his generation, right? But it is for the generation to come. Right? So, presumably, that generation would be around at the time of the removal of the wicked and the ungodly, because that's, behold, he cometh with ten thousands of the saints to execute judgment. So, in other words, there it needs to be not in the canon for a while, right? And then it needs to be in the canon, right? That's by Enoch's own prophecy, right? So, this is why we have this mechanism, because... It is to be left out and forgotten for some time and to be restored on the seventh day or the day of judgment, which is what we're currently in, presumably, based on the timeline as we understand it. Okay, 
So he says, the Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling. In other words, he's going to start showing himself. He's going to start manifesting himself. What is his dwelling? I mean, again, he dwells in heaven, but he dwells in our hearts. He dwells in our minds. He dwells in our mouths. He dwells in our hands. We are his members. He is us, and we are him. He dwells in his word, right? He is in the warp and the woof of all his creation. So it, it could mean a whole lot more than just, you know, a sign in the heaven. It could mean... He's manifesting himself. He's showing himself, right? And he dwells within his word. He dwells within all of us. And the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear from his camp, and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens, right? And again, this is a, this is a show of his might. This is the might of the Lord, that he's able to conceal these things from the people and then reveal them again to the people in just the right time. It's sort of reminiscent of the, the, the walk to Emmaus where their eyes were being held. and they, they, He was with them, but they didn't see him. He was with them, and their hearts were burning, but they could not recognize him. And as soon as he, they recognized him, of course, he disappeared from their sight because he was no longer, he was no longer fleshly to them. It was, it was deeper than that. Um, and it says, And the great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Well, earth is... is the, the, the usage of the term earth is always kind of metaphorical. Um, when you read the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, when you read the, the apocryphal scriptures or whatever, anytime the earth is mentioned, it generally connotes or has is related to the idea of earthly. Um, that is to say, not heavenly, not you know higher level, but lower level. Um, and this exists for a reason, because we talk about the heavenly heavens, in other words, and the earth, right? We talk about the higher level meaning, right, and the lower level meaning of things, right? The earthly level and the spiritual level, right? Um, in Thomas, you speak of wealth versus poverty. Okay. If you understand only in earthly terms with earthly ears, and you see only with the theological, um, you know, sort of academic or tradition or whatever is, is earthly and corresponds with the earth, right? then you don't have the quote-unquote eyes to see and ears to hear. If you come to recognize the patterns here, you come to recognize the intentionality, right? Nothing can change that, not your opinion, not your thoughts or whatever. If it happens to be the case that this is his plan, then it is his plan and it will be carried out, right? But the idea is that there is a heavenly level understanding and an earthly level understanding to everything. Um, and so... When something is stated in figurative terms, we should be able to um, to see past it. So, to to speak of the ends of the earth, for example, you have to you have to think of everything that is earthly, everything that is low, or everything the, or the earthly teaching, the earthly understanding to its fullest extent, to its fullest limit, or whatever, is going to be overcome, and everyone who relies on that system is vulnerable, right? So this is why fear and trembling shall seize them. And the high mountain shall be shaken. We talked about that last week, remember? And we talked about how there was, um, you know, the water and the dry land. And then, you know, um, the Paul talks about the water of the word. If you read the Shepherd of Hermas, for example, it talks about the tower was built upon the water, right? Because the church of God is founded on the word of God, right? So it gives you the, the meaning there. Just, I want to I let people know, the, uh, the Shepherd of Hermas is uh, it's one of the books that was part of the New Testament that fell out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the New Testament mentions a man named Hermas. He's one of the converts of Paul and, and Peter. So uh, he just, after they passed away, he's continuing the works of the apostles. He had certain visions and he wrote uh, a book of his visions. I think one of the earliest copies we have the Bible actually includes the chapter of Hermas in it. So, 
but but I mean it just gives you again it gives you a sense of how that word is used metaphorically. And so when you have mountains, right, earthly mountains, and then you have hills, right, these are kingdoms, right. Uh, these might be, you know, the higher ones, they might be great nations or great kingdoms, and then the lower ones, they might be lower kingdoms, governors, and, you know, earthly powers and rich people and people with influence. You know, in other words, you're uh, above other people. And then with re regards to water, remember how Jude says that these men are wild waves of the sea foaming up their own shape. Remember the sea, the sea has to do with this age, the nations, the peoples, and the tongues, and the kings. That's why... Um, when you enter, why you see in the book of Revelation, for example, once you uh, enter into the millennium, there is no more sea because you've passed the church age, right? In other words, but these are high places within the church. You might think of the papacy, you might think of, you know, the great kingdoms of Christendom or whatever. And of course, we talked about last week, we talked about the angel who had the little book, you know, his right hand was in heaven. Probably the book was in his left hand because his right hand was swearing, you know, and say, but he had a foot on the on the dry land and on the water, and that is because the 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 book, which is the word of God, albeit uh, the canonized because it's the little book, and not the full, um, that he has power over the secular world and over the religious world, and you can see why this is because what I was saying before, the power of this argument is that it's literary in nature. So that you can go to the secular, you can go to the the, the 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 people of this world, the atheists and the Muslims and you know even the Christians really, but, and you can you can show them the truth of this book, and you can show them the power, for example, of how it is that those two books come together to reveal to us what actually happened in the early church age, and reveal it to us, right? Um, so it, it appeals to the secular as well as to the religious. So this is the total power and the total control that he's going to have over the world at the end of the age. And all of this, of course, is to be revealed on the seventh day, which, of course, is where we are now, when the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts, right? Um, and um, they shall melt like wax before the flame, and the earth shall be wholly rent and sunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish. And again, what he's talking about is that which is founded on earthly understanding. Right? So the, well, all that is founded on the earth is everything that's founded on earthly understanding. The reason why we don't like the Book of Enoch boils down to uh, it was never universally agreed upon. People have problems with the angels coming down and, um, you know, mixing with the women, let's say. Um, although Genesis mentions that, and although Jude also mentions that these were angels and not people, right? People should be putting two and two together, but they haven't been, right? And so everything that is formed on the earthly understanding, everything that is upon the earth, in other words, right, um, shall be rent and sunder. It's just going to be torn apart because it's a false foundation. And everything that is upon the earth, you know, all the kingdoms of the earth or whatever, everything that's, you know, that's dependent upon the earth, everything with the earthly level understanding as its origin and its starting point, right, um, is going to perish. So, you know, once this is understood, then the other ideas become entirely untenable. And so this is sort of about the finality and the judgment of false Christianity, false Judaism, and false religion in general, but also the whole world and everything secular along with it. And he says, but with the righteous he will make peace, right? And he will protect the elect. And you can see that, right? You can see how the, uh, the knowledge, the truth, and, and, and whatnot coming to light gives power to the people who will be living at the, in the day of tribulation, right? It gives them the, the authority of the scriptures themselves to reintroduce this book into uh, the Christian world um, and begin to sort of unravel the mysteries in there so that we can actually overcome the world. So it's actually, it's actually designed to be functional in that regard, to actually destroy the world. Um, with its reintroduction and with understanding it again um, in our age, from generation to generation. In other words, from that age to our age. It wasn't for his age, it is for our age. So by him saying it is for our age and for us actually having the mechanism in this canon to bring it back into the fold, so to speak, that is the power, if you will, 
Um, it says, and they shall be prospered, and they shall all be blessed, and he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them. Remember, Peter talks about that, that the word of God is like a light that shineth in a dark place, right? Because the word has not changed, and so therefore has been shining, right? We have not understood it, because our hearts are the dark place. And he says, and he will make peace with them. And then comes Jude's quote. So now that we understand all of this before, right, now we can understand Jude's quote a little better. Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Um, which, again, by negating Jude, again, he says that he's ancient, he says he's a prophet and all that. I mean, we have negated that. So those are the harsh things which we have spoken against him, at least insofar as those books are concerned. Um, now he goes in, I won't spend too much time on this, but he goes into uh, ob observing the heavens and the earth. He says in chapter 2, Observe ye everything that takes place in the heaven, how they do not change their orbits and the luminaries which are in the heaven, how they rise and set and order each in its season, and transfer not, grass not against their appointed order. Behold ye the earth, and give heed to the things which take place upon it from first to last, how steadfast they are, how none of the things upon earth change, how all the works of God appear to you. Behold the summer and winter, how the whole earth is filled with water and cloud and dew and rain lie upon it. Um, so a couple of things. Um, clouds, dew, and rain. Um, um, Rain is actually an interesting thing to mention here in the Book of Enoch because it's the, the common understanding is that it never rained upon the earth, right? And here he is talking about rain and how you're supposed to observe it. And the Bible day, doesn't clearly say it, that it never <laughs> rained, does it? Does the Bible specifically? I think that's sort of the implication, but I, you know, people have this notion that it, right. that, that was the first time it had ever rained. But Enoch is obviously talking about. But, but the clouds, okay, we understand from the canon what the clouds are. Um, for example. Um, in the book of Revelation, behold, he cometh with clouds. Right? And then also in Jude and Enoch here, of course, behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Right? King of Saints, right? Um, but okay, so but I mean, it's just this is algebraic and it's sort of mathematic, right? Because this is the same, that's the same, that's the same, that's the same. So that's parallel, right? And then so, what are clouds? Clouds are representative of the holy ones and the saints, right? And you can kind of check the math because besides parallelism, the way that you can come up with these terms is through um, metaphor. Like for example, in Hebrews. He says that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, right? So you get cloud and witnesses, right, by means of metaphor, cloud of <clears throat> witnesses, right? So witnesses, ten thousands of the same, kind of the same thing, but it has to do with rewards upon the earth. The dew, dew is water, right? Rain is water, clouds, water. All that's water, right? And it has to do with his word and how it's given. There are harsher forms of this that you'll read about later in Enoch, like snow and hail and ice, and those are all bad because they blow. Again, it talks about from some of the portals, and these are figurative, of course, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but just as an explanatory. Um, the idea is that it blows through certain holes, and it's bad, and that's judgment because it's all the water of the word, right? But then these are a, a benefit, right? These are beneficial to the earth. Right, so these are these are they blow for good or they blow for evil. It talks about the dew and the rain or whatever is a reward. So the cloud is the, the saints, right? Um, the rain, again, water from above. Right, um, even Jude talks about this. You know, clouds they are without water. Right, they don't they don't come with the word. Right, the dew. One thing I used to do uh, back when I had a phone that worked like I wanted it to, I had this little, like a little macro lens 
that I would take out on my daily walks, and if I saw something out of the corner of my eye that looked interesting, I'd get like super up close to it. But one of the things I like to take shots of is dew, right? And if you get really close to a dew, one of the things you see is that like dew sort of forms on a flat surface like that, right? So but what it does is it acts as a lens. So you take something small and you'll see it maybe a lot more, a lot larger based on the dew, right? So the idea is if this is water that helps you to sort of magnify or else to see things a little more clearly, right? And so the idea is that these are scriptures, for example, that magnify other scriptures. And so like if you look at one, one page over here, um, this might say that, and you look like you know, another scripture over here, this might say that. And so they sort of magnify one another. The idea is that these are beneficial in that they, uh, if you will, sort of make things clearer to us. But the idea when it talks about all of this stuff here, um, about the, the things that take place in heaven, there's a later book in the Book of Enoch that comes up called the Book of the Heavenly Luminaries. And this is sort of one of the places where it explains how to understand that metaphorically. And we'll get to that if time allows and if you know, people are interested. Um, Summer and winter, um, again, we read from the canon that when you see the leaves sprout forth that you know that summer is nigh, right? Lift up your head, you know that summer is nigh, right? So, um, and in the Gospel of Philip, when it talks about that the um, winter is this world, Right? And then the summer, of course, is the world to come. Future world. Right? So you understand, he gives you a key here, that the world to come is near. When you see the leaves, um, you know, bursting forth. So the idea is that there's... That there's, a, there's, there's a parabolic aspect to what's being said here. This is why he states on several occasions that this book is a parable, that it's parabolic, that it's meant to be read as a metaphor. Um, he says, Observe ye the days of summer, how the sun is above the earth, over against it, and you seek shade and shelter by reason of the heat of the sun, and the earth also burns with a growing heat, so that you cannot tread on the earth or on a rock by reason of its heat. And observe the trees, cover themselves with green leaves and bear fruit, right? Again, you see the, 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 the leaves, right? You see the leaves bursting forth, right? You know that summer is night and bear fruit. Wherefore, give ye heed and know with regard to all his works. So the leaves have to do with his works. And recognize how that he that liveth forever hath made them so. And again, and in other words, the, this knowledge is supposed to give you some concept of his eternity because it's supposed to make you understand how it is he that lives forever that makes it that way. So he has the characteristic of being eternal. And they go, thus they go on year to year forever and all the tasks which they accomplish for him and their tasks change not, but according as God hath ordained, so is it done. And behold how the sea and the rivers in like manner accomplish and change not their tasks from his commandments. And then he contrasts against them. But ye have not been steadfast, nor done the commandments of the Lord. But ye have turned away and spoke in proud and harsh words with your impure mouths against his greatness. Again, by denying the prophets, like, like what we've seen has been passed down to us, that they took the book of Enoch, for example, and they destroyed it. They didn't just, they didn't just set it aside. They didn't just put it in another volume and say, well, we're not so sure about this, but here it is, you know. We, we preserved it for you intact anyway. There's nothing like that. They destroyed it. They ruined it, right? And so, in other words, they acted against God and his plan. Uh, well, I mean, he made allowances for it. He knew the book would be returned, but in order to catch them in what they're doing, right? Because, again, they're hard-hearted. Oh, you hard-hearted, you shall have no peace. Therefore, you shall execrate your days and your life. The, day, the years of your life shall perish, and the years of your destruction shall be multiplied in eternal execration, and you shall find no mercy. Which, again, means that all of their lies are going to come back to bite them in the end, so to speak. Um, that, that they will be found out, and that they will be exposed. It says, and in those days you shall make your names an eternal execration unto all the righteous. In other words, they will be hated. 
they will be vilified by the righteous. You know, they'll have a righteous indignation. These things have been hidden from us. They've been taken from us. We've been lied to. We've been bamboozled, right? We walked around in this fog of confusion because they took away the key of knowledge and they hid it, right? They destroyed these books. They destroyed the understanding that came from the apostles themselves. They were preaching the book of Enoch, right? That is according to Jude and Peter, right? And it says, and, you, and by you shall all who curse curse, and the sinners and the godless shall imprecate by you. And for you, the godless, there shall be a curse. And all the, I guess, righteous, I mean, you can think of anybody uh, who was on the, um, their side rejoicing. And it says, and there shall be forgiveness of sins and every mercy and peace and forbearance. Uh, and salvation shall be, unto, shall be unto them and a goodly light. And for all you sinners, there shall be no salvation. Why? Because, again, we talk about the, the revelation of this mystery to the righteous is deliverance from the unrighteous and from their teaching and from their false paradigm, which has been foisted upon us by their earthly logic. Once their earthly logic is broken, once the, the ax is laid at the root of the tree, so to speak, uh, you know, then, you know, we're talking about foundational stuff. Once you've destroyed the foundation of something, right, then it's completely destroyed, it's completely untenable, it's completely, you know what I'm saying, and their destruction is going to be complete like that. So they build, in other words, everything they build is on a lie. Everything is, you know, whether it's intentional or not, and people picked up the ball and they ran with it, who didn't have the Book of Enoch, who didn't know this stuff. I think there's something to be said for limiting the number of really, really super guilty people in this, getting rid of them early. You know what I'm saying? So that the people afterwards, it might be plausibly said that they didn't know or they couldn't know. If you don't actually have the Book of Enoch, it's not, not in existence. It doesn't matter how much of this you believe. You don't even have the book, you know, to, to, to appeal to. You know what I'm saying? They took that away from you. So again, the onus is on them. It says, but, you know, again, there shall be salvation unto them, a goodly light. Um, for, for all you sinners, there shall be no salvation, but on you shall abide a curse. And it says, but for the elect, there shall be light and joy and peace, and they shall inherit the earth. Right? So maybe Yeshua was quoting this. I mean, it seems to be, you know, his terminology. Um, the meek shall inherit the earth, the elect shall inherit the earth. Right? Um, and there shall be bestowed upon the elect wisdom, and they shall all live, and they shall never again sin. In other words, it's like, it's like because it's an illusion, because it's, because because the book is hidden from you by means of deception and you don't see it because it's sort of like you really would have to, 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 to go at it and keep after it and be tenacious about it to really get down to the bottom of it, which people haven't done because they've gone with earthly logic and stuff. Um, and it says, um, they shall not again transgress, uh, nor shall they sin all the days of their lives. Um, basically, all, all that we have been doing is sinning because we've been missing the mark. We've been missing the truth. We've been missing the teaching all of this time. And it's because we didn't know and because we didn't understand and we didn't have the spiritual intuition because it wasn't granted to us at that time. It was for the time of removal of the wicked and the ungodly. So it's been kept from us, but it's returned to us as a reward. Um, and it says, but they who are wise shall be humble. Again, because you got to understand your proper perspective in all of this. You know, other people have labored, and we have entered in upon their labors. You know, even if you were to fathom these mysteries all the way from beginning to end and top to bottom, it's really very little credit to any one of us. It's all of credit to the people who laid this stuff down. You know, that's why it says, you know, in, that you shall be greater than John the Baptist, but at, get that at the same time, Thomas points out that your eyes should be lowered before him, right? Because you should be humble. And they shall not again transgress, nor shall they sin all the days of their lives, nor shall they die of the divine anger or wrath. Remember in Revelation where it talks about the, the children of Jezebel? I will kill her children with death, right? Again, that's a metaphorical death, right? Um, you know, death is not understanding or not having uh, an idea of what the living scriptures are teaching you, and so therefore you're in a state. Uh, but they shall complete the number of the days of their lives, and their lives shall be increased in peace, and the years of their life shall be multiplied in eternal gladness and peace all the days of their life. Um, let's see. I don't have time to get into this whole thing here. 
Um, well, looking at chapter 10. It says, And then the Most High, the Holy and Great One, spake and sent Uriel to the son of Lamech, and said to him, Go to Noah and tell him in my name, Hide thyself and reveal to him the end that is approaching, that the whole earth will be destroyed, and a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth, and it will destroy all that is on it. Go and instruct him that he may escape, and his seed may be preserved for all generations of the world. So, here we have the figure of Noah. Um, how would we have gotten the book of Eden? Right? Would be an interesting question. If, for example, we read a little bit later on, and, and everybody should read this book on their own. It's, it's all available online. You can go to, you can go to um, YouTube. You can actually do a reading of the book of Eden if you want to hear it. Uh, it's on my YouTube channel. Um, I've got several of them up, you know, all from beginning to end. Um, and you can understand it from beginning to end. One of the things that happens is we understand that Enoch gives his book to Methuselah. Right? And, of course, Methuselah, of course, when he dies, the flood's going to come, right? That's the name. So... This get, apparently gets bequeathed to Noah upon his death, or sometime prior to his death. It gets bequeathed to Noah, world is destroyed, Noah comes out on the other side with the Book of Enoch. You know, if, if you read it in a straightforward way. But that book was preserved from antediluvian times. So that you could, you could, you could say that one of... The, the, the consequences of the flood or whatever is that the book of Enoch is preserved, right? By means of Noah, presumably. Um, so this book, it's, there's, there's some attention paid to the preservation of this book, apparently, as you read it. Um, but so now the book of Noah is somewhat broken up and spread out throughout um, the book of Enoch in a, in a, in a way that makes it kind of hard to follow. Um, you can actually take those texts and extract them and order them in a way that makes more sense, and I might do that um, just to kind of make sense of it. But the idea is that there's all these players involved in the preservation of that book and all these phenomena that happen, that book is in mind, right, in its preservation. Um, it says, Now an instructing that he may escape, and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. And again the Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into darkness, and make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudael, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and his, that his face may not see light, and on the day of his, the great judgment he shall be cast into the fire. Again, we read about the second death, and those who cast, you know, who were cast into there, it's kind of the same thing. But the idea is that Azazel, all right, that before the flood, there were the watchers who came down, but they, they had different assignments and different jobs. They went down to Mount Hermon, right? Okay, and, you know, they made mutual imprecations, uh, you know, on Mount Hermon or whatever. In other words, they bound themselves by a curse, right? And you see all this language is symbolic, you know, darkness, desert, you know, rocks, etc., there's a lot of symbolism here. But the idea is that these people conspired to, to trip up humanity, just like it was in the garden, where you had the serpent who, whose job it was, whose mission it was, for whatever reason, to trip up humanity and get them to eat from the knowledge of good and evil. You have a similar story with these angels who came down from heaven, right? And they conspired together under mutual imprecations, which is kind of mafioso type stuff, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, if you don't do this and you're dead or whatever, whatever their mutual yeah. imprecations are, what right? Um, kind of conspiratorial. I mean, if you're looking for conspiracies, this is like the all-time mother conspiracy, so to speak. I mean, it pretty much starts with that. Um, but they come down and they, they do their thing with the daughters of men or whatever. It's not so hard to imagine, you know, I hate to get off on this tangent, but if you, if you drive through a suburban neighborhood and you ask yourself how many single men 
are living in these suburban neighborhoods, you know, with five and six bedrooms and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? I doubt it would be very many, right? Because men have a tendency to, how shall I say, sacrifice and give and, you know, to provide, or that's kind of the expectation anyway. You know, the idea is that, that what men need is very little, generally speaking. Again, I'm not speaking broad sweeping generalities here. You know, um, the idea is that they, their lives would be simple if not for the fact that they would, they would rather have a wife and children and extended family and, you know, preserve their seed or whatever. And so, you know, if you think about what they do if they're single versus what they do if they're married, what they have when they're single, when they're not, you know what I'm saying? It's not so hard to understand why the way to get through men is to get to the women. Um, you see that again with Adam and Eve and stuff because he felt sort of obliged to do it because she had done it. And to, to you know, essentially, he, her fate was going to be his fate, right? But the idea is that, is that, that for whatever reason, and again, I, it's not super clear, but I'm, I'm just I'm just pointing that out. The idea is that um, that for some reason they wanted to create a hybrid species between the angels and man, and they wanted to teach men um, about how shall I say things like war and cosmetics and a lot of yeah metallurgy and, and all the kinds of things that we see kind of in our modern world um, and I'm not going to have time to get through this whole section um, in fact I may skip it but the idea is that um, that you know how when it says in the Bible um, um, about how so it will be in the, as it was in the days of Noah. Which can mean a lot of things or it can mean very narrow things. It's hard to generalize about something like this. It could be everything all the way from technology. Um, if it were that, some of this would make sense. Um, because apparently the angels wanted to teach technology. They wanted to teach war. They wanted to teach cosmetics. They wanted to teach um, the smitings, if it will, the embryo of the womb. There's all these things that are delineated that they wanted to corrupt men with. And just supposing that technology is a double-edged sword, could be good, could be bad, right? Which I think we see in our day. You know, it could be good, it could be bad. It just depends on who's wielding it, who has power over it, who's controlling it. You know, and, and the state of mankind. You know, there our hearts and our souls and our minds collectively. What do we put up with? You know, we put up with bad politicians. That's why we have them. We put up with corruption because that's why we have corruption, right? Um, so, if it means that in the days of Noah they did have technology, just supposing they did, because either they did or they didn't. It's not we don't know. But just supposing they did, it would sort of explain why the world world had to be destroyed, right? Because none of this stuff should be left to us. It would also explain why there's very little in the way of, how shall I say, science and technology in the Bible because giving men the, the, the secrets, if you will, of technology was something that the evil angels were trying to do. And that the Bible isn't really trying to give away the secrets of technology, not trying to give away the secrets of, you know, the things that men were seeking out. It's just letting them seek them out. Um, but in the, in the antediluvian days, the angels were actually actively pushing this stuff. They were actually pushing this stuff. Um, we know, for example, just with an emergent technology that we have right now, for example, you know, when, when I came up here and gave the infamous chat GPT discussion, you know, the idea is that, is that, that we have a modern technology like with artificial intelligence. If we have it now, the idea is that if we have something like artificial intelligence, if we have something like computers, if we have something like rocketry and space, you know, uh, ships and, and telescopes and things of that sort, those kinds of things could be done in any time and any place on earth or in our universe. Like it could have happened in the days of Noah 
that they had this technology because we know that that technology can exist. We, we have it now. So again, if there's nothing new under the sun or whatever, but the idea is that we will be living in a time that parallels, you know, what it was in the days of Noah. And so as we approach what we, because we know that the watchers were teaching all this stuff and they were aiming to teach all of this stuff, we have searched these things out ourselves and have found these things. And now we are living in a very perilous and dangerous time where what we know can kill us, what we know can destroy us, right? And so now might be a good time for God to act and to deliver us from that eventuality. I want to mention something real quick and uh, just kind of interesting things. Well, first let's talk about demons. Where do demons come from? What are they? A lot of people assume they're fallen angels, right? Thank you, brother. Does the Bible explicitly say that? Fall of angels, fall of Satan. This is kind of interesting, is that a lot of people, I think the origin of Alexander is the first one to do this, to my knowledge. They, he's extrapolated the story of the fall of Satan from um, two biblical accounts. One is uh, uh, Ezekiel's story of the king of Tyre, right? Right. And the other one is, I think, in Isaiah, you have the, the king of Babylon. So the idea is like, oh, well, he's talking about the king of Tyre, he's talking about the the king of Babel, but he's actually alluding to, he's really talking about the fall of Satan. But I think this is a, this is open to interpretation. There's only two scriptures I can think of that explicitly tell the story that, or mention the fall of Satan. You can think of what they are. That's right. Jesus said, "I saw Satan fall from, like lightning from heaven." Right. So Jesus says. But the question is. And then we. Two thirds of the stars. Revelation, that's Revelation. That's that's correct. The only explicit, uh, the only explicit account of the fall of of Satan would be in the book of Revelation. The red dragon takes his tail, and a third of the the angels or the stars go down with him. Right. That the, the story of the red dragon in the book of Revelation is clearly. It's not talking about the king of Tyre. It's not talking about the king of Babylon. Obviously, this is Satan and his fall. Right. Um. So. It's also kind of interesting that even though he's talked about having to fall from heaven, when we read Job, we talk about how he still has the right correct. to counsel. That's correct. Satan means heaven. the accuser. It's like some people look at, well, they say, well, the role, of, the devil has a specific, or Satan has a specific job. He's, the, he's God's prosecuting attorney, basically. That's how some people interpret that. So he's still in heaven, or he's going back. And, what, what does he say to this well, is I don't Job. Know about now, but we at least know that in right. Job's time. He's in the book of Job, he is going around. He's like a lion seeking made to buy on earth, right? Where have you been? I've been, you know, going back and forth on the earth. But he goes, he has admitted into the court of heaven, right? And you also see that in the, uh, the, the accuser of our brethren. Obviously, Satan is accusing us before God today, the right? Is, does he still have that after the cross? That's, right? that's or is, true. Or is Christ taking that position over? Okay. Right, and, and when did Jesus when see Jesus him fall from Jesus lightning from heaven? heaven he could. Was that was, was that his, his original his fall? So, <laughs> what I'm saying is, some people believe that what you have fallen angels, and then you have demons. So, in this David Bentley Hart translation, he's he's putting out the idea that almost all the time in the New Testament, the demonic spirits. What do they say to Jesus? You know, oh, don't send us the, the before this before our time. our time, right? His interpretation, I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying this is what certain scholars think, is that demonic entities are actually the uh, disembodied spirits of the Nephilim who were killed. And their their souls are wandering the earth and doing mischief until the day of So judgment. not quite angels, it not actually quite says that, you know, yeah, Pretty much in so many words. To see right. Yeshua doing that so often... You know, would also lend itself to that interpretation. It, it's interesting, but what, what? Okay, so what I'm saying is, Jesus clearly saw Satan fall from heaven. The Book of Revelation. This is a certain 
description of the fall of the devil, right? I don't think there's a dispute about that. These could be, but, you know, they're mainly about the fall of the king of Tyre, mainly about the, the fall of the king of Babylon, but they might be alluding to, in a symbolic language, another event. Uh, but, you know, this is what, these are certain things that, that scholars <laughs> like, that, that debate about. And the, the angels that sinned, of course, you could have had different fallings, right? You could have had, you know, the fall of Satan. Yeah. And then in the, we have these other, you have Sam Yaza and Azazel, right? These could be, this could be a com completely different incident, right? And the thing is, in the book of Enoch, and it, it talks about Tartarus. Tartarus. Because you know, the Greeks had Hades, right? Mm -hmm. We know that. We Sometimes people say that, so they say hell. We, the word hell is a, a Norse goddess, right? We still use that. Uh, so sometimes hell is kind of impolite, so people say Hades. But Tartarus is like a specific region. And this is where the, the Titans. Apollyon. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, it could be that, that he's one of these demons that's, that's, they're confined, these, like, Azazel, well, Azazel's loose, but most of the, the fallen angels, the, the fallen watchers, are confined to Tartarus. See, it talks about that in the Bible, it talks about these angels are in, in chains of darkness. Is the devil in chains of darkness? No, he's out and about. But so, Apollyon appears at the end. Yes, Apollyon might be one of these, you know, there could have been different. I mean, it's just it's something interesting. Well, that is Apollo. It is also called Saturn. Like you're saying, every right. every culture has them by different names. So, really quick, by the way, and we'll, we'll conclude with this. Zeus is Apollyon. So, here we have the Mediterranean Sea, right? And what happened? The, the Muslims came and they took over North Africa. Ethiopia is, oops, it goes like that. Ethiopia is Christian. And they preserved Enoch, they used Enoch, nobody told them to the part of the Bible, and that's why we still have it. But the greater Christian world uh, lost the book of Enoch. They had a, a, a part of the book of Enoch in China, uh, but that was lost. They found it, you know, hidden in a cave in China for a thousand years. Just recently, in the 20th century, they, they, they found these manuscripts. But it was never really lost in Ethiopia, right? They've always... Uh, They've always had it, and they use it as, as part of the Bible. It's canonized down there. But we, because of Islam, we didn't have contact or relations. Probably if they did, they probably would have tried to repress it down there, too. <laughs> yeah. Catholic, the Catholic Church actually went into Ethiopia, and they, they probably would have got, because they, they did the same thing in India. Oh, there's Christians here already. Okay, well, let me, let's see all your books. They started burning books. In India. Just start burning all these books. So what happened is the, the Ethiopians like, hey, look, we've been Christians since the time of the apostles. Without you, we don't need you telling us how to do things. We're fine with you. We're not going to let you burn our book of Enoch. And, you know, who knows what all they burnt in Ethiopia and, and, uh, and, and in India, too. They get there and they should start finding all the books they can put in the, you know, pile up and start burning. <laughs> so, so anyway, they had to fight. They actually had to fight back in India and in Ethiopia. Get the Catholics out of there. Stop that nonsense. <laughs> Got to burn the books. Find those books and burn them. That's, I don't think that's a, the right way, right? <laughs> so.